Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to just make a, a brief presentation about the application process and the application forms. Um, I'm going to talk about three things, I hope. Yeah, these are the three things. So I know where to apply, um, the application forms themselves, uh, part A, part B, part C. And just a few tips um, that we would ask you to remember when you're completing them. So it's very simple for where you apply. It's through the funding and tenders portal. Um, the applicants who were successful at the first stage have all been sent a link to how to apply and to ensure that it's only those 70 who can apply. So if you haven't, if you're watching this and you haven't been successful um, or you're thinking about doing it for the future, then you won't have received this link, so you won't be able to apply. So it's in the funding and tenders portal. Now, when you're in the funding and tenders portal, there are lots of ways that you can get help. And you will see here on the slide, it shows you that you can ask questions if you want to on the sort of the content or on the IT. So you've got plenty of opportunities to get the assistance uh, that you need to enable you to fill this in. Now, moving on to the forms. The forms have a part A, a part B and part C. Um, the part A is very similar to what you had in the first stage call. It's additional and has greenhouse gas indicators there. The part B, this is uh, limited to 70 pages. Um, it incorporates the new award criteria, so scalability and cost efficiency, and it in wants information on the particular work packages, and I'll come on to those in a minute. This part, so the part B, has to be prepared outside the portal and then uploaded into the portal. You don't complete it on online. So I'm going to concentrate now on the bits on the, the part B. So there is a new part, obviously, which is asking you to explain any changes you're making to the proposal compared to the first stage. And I want to be clear here that some changes are acceptable and some changes are not acceptable. So giving you examples of acceptable changes. So obviously, if your project is advanced between when you submitted it back in uh, in December, uh, sorry, at the end of October and now, or when you submit it, then it's logical that you update your implementation plan because of this. Similarly, the business plan could have changed, um, for example, due to market evolution or to the changes in the regulatory framework. And you may have had the opportunity to uh, have a more detailed or advanced feasibility study or due diligence report. So these are things that you can change from the, f the uh, first stage proposal that you submitted. But the things that you shouldn't be changing, um, it's whether it, it's something that's very fundamental to uh, what you're actually intending to do in the project. So exam for example, if you are wanting to change the technological solution that you, are, you propose in the first stage, this isn't, this isn't really possible. So because it would call into question the assessment that the evaluators made uh, at the first stage uh, with your proposal. Similarly, um, you can't have a change in the EU contribution that you request by more than 50%. So that gives you an idea of what's an acceptable change and unacceptable change. The important thing is to explain here very clearly what the changes are. Be transparent about it um, and explain why those changes have been made. So you'll see there are further parts that have to be completed. The first part of these is related to uh, the selection of criteria and technical scope of the proposal. So I, I list them here. Um, these will be examined by the evaluators. Um, the financial capacity will also be looked at in more detail if you're successful in the in, in being asked to prepare a, a grant with Sinea. So we will look at that in more detail later as well. Then on the uh, award, the, this next part is on the award criteria, and you've already had lots of presentations on that. 
Again, the important thing is to explain very clearly uh, and as simply as you can, um, so that it's easy for the evaluators to get the information that they need out of the proposal uh, to make their assessment. So moving on to the part on the work packages. Um, so there's a template for work packages which we want you to use. The way the grant disbursement works is that you will get it paid when you complete a work package. So the basic message is that if you want to be paid at a certain point, you need to make sure there is a work package that will be completed um, by that point. And it should ideally be a self-contained work package. I'll come into a, onto this in a minute in a bit more detail and show you an, exa um, an example of the type of planning procedure. Then, it, of course, the payment that you ask for in the, when you complete the work package needs to be proportionate to the work you're intending to do. And, of course, evaluators will, will look at that. We don't want you just asking for lots of money because it would be nice to have lots of money early in the project. It has to be proportionate to what you're actually going to be doing in that work package. You also need to provide sufficient information that will allow the, uh, the, the work package and the project overall to be monitored well and managed well. And the, the experts will typically look at this uh, quite carefully. And I'll come on to the next point in a minute, which is that uh, after the entry into operation, the reporting has to be annual. And this means effectively you need to have one work package per year. I'll now move on to this next slide, which shows this hopefully in more uh, detail. It's separated into the three different phases of the project, the financial close phase, the entry operation phase, and the operation phase. We give you an example here which of potential work packages. So for example, you may need in the first couple of years uh, to undertake some technical studies. And then when they're completed, that fits nicely at the end of a work package. Therefore, at that stage, you could expect to uh, want to have a payment. You then also may need to do during the financial close phase some preparatory work. I mean, it could be drilling, it could be something else. Um, and in, in that, when that's finished, that's a, a, a work package, then you would say, yes, that's finished, and then you would be paid. Um, moving on to the entry into operation, you could do it in terms of your construction uh, annually if you wanted, but you could also pick different periods for this. But then when you move on to the, the operations phase, then, as I just said earlier, it is uh, annual work packages, okay? That's it. that's the way we expect you to to structure it. But the, again, the basic me me message is you have the the payments will be linked to the completion of work packages. Therefore, if you feel that you're going to need a payment for a particular time, there has to be a work package that that when it ends, there can be a payment. So in the part B, there's also a a, a lot of documents that you'll need to. As to supply, I've listed them here. I'm not going to go through them, but just bear in mind that they are mandatory, a lot of them. And therefore, if you don't submit them with your application, then there's a risk that your application will be declared ineligible, which means that it won't actually be assessed by evaluators. And that's obviously going to be very frustrating, not just for you, but also for us, given that we've been through this process of the first stage application. So really, Ensure that you've got all these uh, mandatory documents. There are also some optional ones that you can use to further substantiate uh, your, your proposal. Then on the page limit, I think it's important that you bear this in mind. I said that there's a limit of 70 pages for the Part B. And then for the four annexes that have, we put abbreviated here, so that's the, the feasibility study the business plan, the project implementation plan, and the knowledge sharing plan, there is a maximum of 200 pages for those. And if you, uh, if you use more than that, then the, well, the, the, the system will cut automatically the uh, pages at the end, and they won't be given to evaluators. And therefore, the evaluators are likely to assess those documents as being incomplete. And of course, that's likely to have a negative effect 
on your pro proposal's chances of being selected. There is also a part C that you're going to have to complete. And in con contrast to the part B, where you have to download the form and fill it in and then upload it into the system, this, is a for this has to be filled in online, this part C. Um, you, we would ask that you really ensure that information that you insert here is coherent and consistent with the information that you have put in other parts of the application. However, if we or the experts see that there are contradictions, we will use the information in Part B as taking precedence over this information. So let's be absolutely clear about that. Now, this is a form. There are mandatory fields in it. So you won't be able to submit your proposal if you don't fill out these mandatory fields. And I would really urge you to start completing this information as soon as possible. I just imagine yourself uh, on the closure date trying to submit and the system says you can't submit because you haven't filled out these fields and because of that you missed the deadline. It would be extremely frustrating and I would be very sorry for you if you did that, but just so please start completing all this information early. Then just some, some basic, basic tips. Um, it, these will seem very straightforward but uh, I, I think it's worth uh, saying them again. So first, obviously, read all the documents. There is a lot of, a lot of documentation, there's a lot of information, but please read it carefully. Understand what we're asking you to do, and if you read it all well in advance and you still have questions, we've shown you the different ways uh, that you can get answers to your questions. We'd ask that you submit well in advance of the deadline. Now, the system is set up in a way that you can submit in advance the deadline. And then if you want to adapt what you've submitted, you can do that up until the, the actual call deadline. So there is no reason why you should be leaving it to, to the last minute. Um, you can complete parts of the proposal well in advance. Um, and we would really urge you to do that. Um, I realize it's difficult um, often and people, some people need the pressure for a deadline, but just imagine if there's an issue which prevents you from uh, being able to submit, um, it would be extremely frustrating uh, for you and obviously difficult to justify to your management uh, why you missed it, because the deadline that we've set is strict. On the part B, uh, experience shows when dealing with evaluations, um, that it's the clarity of the information that is more important than the quantity of information. The experts have a lot of information to get through and they have a limited amount of time to access it. it the, the clearer that you can make it, the less effort that the experts have to expend to get it, the, it generally the better mood they will be in and they will obviously want to be more predisposed, well disposed towards your project. So make sure that you focus on the clarity of the information and not on the quantity of the information. Experts also get frustrated if they can't find uh, information in annexes if they, if, when things are referred to. So make sure you, when you're doing cross-references that they are clear to the, and they're to the right place, the right annexes. Um, experts also get annoyed and it undermines the credibility of your proposal if information in different documents is inconsistent. They then think, well, does the applicant really know what they're doing? Have they thought this through? Have they really checked it? So it, it, it's important that you ensure the consistency. And then finally, for the part B, use the requested font size. This is an obligation, and it's one of the things that uh, my team will be checking when the proposals are submitted. Because clearly, if you decide to use a font size that is smaller then you can pack in more information. It's not necessarily a good idea, as I said before, but uh, then you could be at an unfair advantage uh, compared to other proposals. So use that uh, font size and, and that's it. that should be all you use. Respect the page limits. Again, that's important because as I've explained, the ev evaluators will not simply not be given the information that you include in the excess pages. And then the final tip 
is to uh, consult the frequently asked questions in the funding and tendons portal. Here's uh, some links to the information where you can watch the, the uh, information on the application process from the previous, uh, uh, well, the first stage of the large scale call. And here are also some links that you can use if you want to get further support. There we are. That's uh, it. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Robert, for the clear presentation and the very useful practical tips indeed. Uh, I think they're good advice to follow to, to prevent a frustration of applicants. Um, we see uh, quite a few questions on, on uh, Slido. A lot of them you have addressed in your presentation, but I will ask maybe just, uh, just a few. So uh, you covered, I think, where is Form C and what is, uh, what is Form C. Um, there has been a question that uh, a footnote 28 is, is missing. Uh, I think we are, we are addressing that, right? Right. So I think it, my understanding is it is in the process or, of being updated if it hasn't been updated already. So, yes, it, it will be put in. Great. Uh, there is also a question where can applicants find the declaration of honour and where can they, uh, can they submit that? Okay, so the Declaration of Honour is, is not something that needs to be submitted at this stage, apparently. This is something that is, comes in, is important when we get to the signing of the grants agreements, okay? So that's, that's when it's important because that's when you, uh, yeah, everybody in the uh, consortium, if there is one, or the applicant needs to basically swear that all the information that they have put in the, the, the grants agreement is, is, is true. Yeah. And speaking of subcontractors, there is a question whether they need to be indicated with their PIC numbers, etc., in Form A already now? That I need to get back on. I don't know the answer of that, to that offhand, I'm afraid. Okay. Then maybe it's a question uh, which could be resubmitted to the help desk or when the applicant yeah. starts filling yeah. in the template, if it's compulsory, it will just pop up as, as an error, yeah. if, if not. Yeah. Um, then there was an interesting question uh, about the changes to the documents which have been submitted in phase one and are resubmitted in phase two, whether these changes have to be, have to be highlighted or how they should be uh, indicated. The important thing is, in, the, in my, during my presentation, I said that there's a particular part in the application form where they need to explain what the changes are. And I think that's where you, and we need to concentrate on, on the key changes. So I would say that you really need to do it there rather than each of the, the supporting documents. I think it could get very messy if you were to do that. So make sure it's absolutely clear what the changes are so the evaluators can, can assess um, whether there has been a significant change or not. Super. Thank you very much. That's, that's very clear because it can be also a lot of work to do it in, in two places and can lead to confusion clearly. There is also a question whether complete CVs will be will be required, uh, for example, one page for each person of the project, or is a short paragraph with their with the qualifications of each person enough? Hmm. I think the important thing is that they have to demonstrate that these are the competent people who can do the work. This is what we're in, into. We don't want pages and pages of information here. So I think it's really for um, each of the applicants to judge this. 